Uh, this first question is for, for Tim and, and uh, Larry and Scott. Uh, I just want to know sort of the genesis of the project because I know that, that, uh, that Larry and Scott were going to direct this initially and you were going to produce it, Tim. I just wanted to know sort of what that process was like. Well, I stole it from them. <laughs> no, I mean, he's our Walter well, Keene. They, you know, we were working on parallel kind of universes yeah. because I didn't know Scott Larry were writing a script on, on this, and I had actually met uh, somebody told me this story. I didn't know, you know, I knew Keene's work because I grew up with it. Uh, I didn't know the real story, and a friend of mine told me it, and then I was in San Francisco once and met her, and uh, commissioned a painting from her, and then. Uh, I don't know how long after that. Uh, it was about a couple years after that we, we approached you about producing the movie. Yeah. And, and we, so, I mean, whatever, we did Ed Wood together, so we had this relationship the, yeah. along the other time. And so we, yeah. we came up with this project. Uh, we discovered Margaret's story. We were actually doing a, a movie that, uh, a script that took place on another planet. And we needed examples of like uh, Earth kitsch that kind of destroyed this higher civilization. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we were getting like disco balls and that kind of stuff. And we discovered the story. And we discovered like the, this painful, truthful story behind the, those paintings. And we were like, that's a movie. And uh, so we developed it for a while. And, we, and it fell apart a couple times. And then we approached him about uh, him directing it and us producing the movie. Uh, the qu this question is for the actors. Because all of you are new to the sort of Tim Burton universe. Um, what, what about you do you think you know, makes you a good Tim Burton character? And Tim, what, what did you see in, in all these new actors? Um, well, I mean, obviously, they're great actors. So <laughs> and, and, and I've, I've, I've admired all of them. So it was a, just seemed like a, you know, it, it all fit. I mean, it was like, it was like a, um, y y y you know, he's Walter. She's Margaret. Yeah, I mean, these people are very, you know, I mean, I, you know, and it was just fresh energy for me to, to work with new people and because, and, uh, you know, everybody's been getting sick of the people I was working with, so. <laughs> oh. I know, it's sad, isn't it? I was also getting sick of the people he was working with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go down the line. Uh, the first question, Danny, uh, you obviously play this like unscrupulous sort of gossip columnist. Did you look uh, to inspiration for any particular people who maybe you have encountered uh, in your uh, life? Well, I didn't have to really look all that far, truthfully. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I play this sort of uh, uh, columnist, a uh, character called Dick Nolan, and uh, it was uh, sort of just fun to sort of play that sort of tabloid aspect of the art world and, and really also just... Uh, uh, serving the story and, and uh, asking the question in regards to what is art. Uh, did, did you have any sort of, uh, well, first of all, what, what did you guys think of these paintings? I mean, did, when you first saw these paintings, were you fans or, or, or what did you think? Well, I'll say that, that uh, Christoph, you, you want <laughs> we have two good friends. Well, I mean, I grew up with it, so, I mean, it was very present. I, I always felt that it was like suburban art. I mean, you know, it was in people's living rooms, in doctor's office, dentist's office, and, you know, I, it was culturally just very present at the time that, that I grew up, and uh, I, I, I can't say, well, I like things that I find, you know, fascinating, I, I find them quite disturbing, actually, I mean, it's like Big Brother watching you, these big eyes, and, and, uh, and, and, and the polarized sort of responses to it. Some people loved it, obviously, and some people just wanted to rip it off the walls. And, and so that kind of response I found quite fascinating. Uh, Kristen, uh, your character obviously sort of thinks that Walter is a jerk from the, from the get-go. But, I mean, do you, do, did you think that he was, you know, had any kind of artistic ambition, or was he purely sort of a vampire? I think that he is a total vampire. <laughs> Flat out. Okay, Kristoff. <laughs> Uh, what was it like sort of trying to uh, make this character, you know, likable, even though he is sort of a complete sociopath? What's not to be liked? <laughs> um, well, I don't get it. Uh, I, um, should I answer that seriously? Because, because um, if, if he weren't like, likable, you wouldn't have a story. Um, why would why would Margaret hook up with um, an unlikable character? The, um, also, the story the story shows the the or the, asks you to participate in one way or another in that development of this relationship. 
the relationship only makes sense when you can, to some degree, identify with it. If um, you have an unlikable person, why would you want to identify with um, a, a relationship, a story? And wh what would you think about Margaret? Well, I think it, he's not, I think he has like very sociopath within him and this just sort of attention and kind of brings it out. But I don't think when we meet him, he's a sociopath. He just develops some, would you call it sociopathic? Kind of tendencies. I don't know. Yeah, the pressure Narcissistic. of uh, the pressure of market econ economy is uh, something that brings out the worst in all of us. <laughs> uh, Amy, what was it like playing such a subtle character? Especially the last time we saw you was in was in American Hustle, which was so crazy and sort of wild. Was was that part of the appeal? No, I mean yes, and this, but but I didn't really think of her as a subtle person. I just thought of her as Margaret, and that's Margaret. So it wasn't as though I was like aiming to portray a thing. I was portraying a person, and she's a very understated human being and a very. Um, although she gave us some zingers the other night, I don't know yeah, if you heard about it. Really, she was like she on did. fuego. Yeah. She was great, um, but but just uh, her nature is very um, internal. So I didn't uh, feel as though I was portraying a thing, per se, but a person. So. Uh, and Jason, sort of how did you get into the mindset of being the snooty <laughs> art critic? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, uh, I've been waiting to play this. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, and, um, fine, fine, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, like a gallery owner or in the art world, there's so many different people that make the machine work. but. A gallery owner is someone who represents, you know, what is going to be sold and how much things cost and their value, whatever that means. And so it's a fun character to play, especially, you know, to Walter, who's coming in with something quite wild. And he's, you know, he's kind of like the gatekeeper of, of his street. <laughs> it's funny, actually, um, uh, Kristen and I last weekend showed uh, the movie at Miami Art Basel, and it was to an audience of nothing but the Jason Schwartzman character, you know, the gallery owners and Terrence Stamps. And we were a little nervous, like how, how this, you know, how the keen art in the film would go over with these people. But, you know, it, just walking around that, that arena, it made it instantly clear that the whole line between high art and low art, art and commerce has just been totally blurred. And, and you know, it's like Walter Keen could do what he, he did back then today and just be honest about it. Like, oh, someone else paints my paintings and I put my name on it and watch my TED talk, you know. Uh, Larry and Scott, uh, supposedly the, the actual sort of trial was even more outlandish than what was in the movie. I mean, how did you guys decide sort of what to, to contain and what to sort of let go? Yeah, I mean, we, we got all the coverage from the Honolulu papers, and it, it was a Marx Brothers scene. And it was, it was so extreme that we, what's always painful is we had to cut jokes out <laughs> because Walter's behavior was so erratic. I mean, by, by the end of this downward spiral, he was really delusional. He really believed he was the painter. He really believed he could be his own lawyer. He was running back and forth to the witness box, interrogating himself. The judge was calling on the bailiffs to shackle him and screaming at him that he had cement between his ears. And he was bringing in ex-girlfriends to testify on his behalf. And they were calling him a pig on the stand. And I mean, it was so bananas. Uh, that we, we, we had to pull back just so we could have some sense of reality in the climax of this movie. Right. Uh, Amy, could you, could you talk about the challenge? Oh, now we can uh, hear you. Of, of playing this woman who we meet, uh, leaving a controlling husband, fleeing with her daughter, and it's like a revolving door. She goes into this new situation, and I think people today can sort of understand abused women who are physically abused, but this psychological... Uh, captivity that she's she's in for 10 years you know it seems like a remarkable thing that you have to do um, I, I think that that's it's very common unfortunately part of psychological abusive relationships it's like very isolating and very controlling and very soon you feel complicit to whatever that abuse is and in this case it was a lie in which she chose to be a part of I believe she even to this day gives Walter credit saying I wouldn't be known if it weren't for him and he was a genius at what he did and 
I would have never had the following that I have today. Um, the thing that I liked about Margaret and what I felt kept her from, uh, from playing a victim, because I didn't want her to feel like a victim, was when you talk to her, she does still take credit, and, uh, or she still uh, has, uh, takes responsibility. Like, she feels guilty that Walter ended up the way he did. She's like, maybe if I didn't lie, he would not have turned out like he did, with that poor character kind of thing. Like, she really feels badly, and, and I, I liked the, her sense of uh, ownership in, in this, uh, in the deception. And had you met her before this? No, I mean, I was familiar with her art, but I had not met her. I met her um, a couple weeks before we started filming. I kind of sat down with her for a day. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Hi, uh, this question is for Tim Burton. Were you drawn to this story and this character, Margaret Keene, in any way, because of the, uh, personally, because of the challenges you face in uh, the movie industry being dominated by business interests? Well, yeah, and uh, I mean, that's why I enjoyed Ed Wood, <clears throat> that Scott and Larry wrote as well, because it, the, 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 there's, to me, there's a fine line of what's perceived as good and bad, and uh, you know, I've been through that myself. Uh, you know, when they had the, the MoMA show here, you know, the critics, you know, I was about 100 times worse than Walt Keene, you know, I mean, it, it got so lambasted, and, and, and then it, at the same time, you know, it had a high attendance rate, you know, so you, I've experienced that kind of thing of like good and bad and, 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 uh, and you know, the, the, the fine line, because when you do something, you're very passionate about it, and whether it's like uh, Ed Wood or, or the Keens, you know, they're, they're just such enthusiasm, and you know, they thought they were making probably, you know, like, you know, Michelangelo is where you know, Ed Wood thought he was making Star Wars when he was doing Plan <laughs> 9 from Outer Space. So, I, you know, you understand that kind of misguided enthusiasm, and then you understand the sort of polarization of, of people's responses to things. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about the film is that it's, you know, it's at the cusp of the 50s to the uh, to the 60s, and so we also get to see this backdrop. And I was kind of curious to know what you guys, maybe for all of you, to reflect on what you learned or how you had to sort of insinuate yourself into the backdrop of the, you know, beats to the hippies, and, and also how this art kind of contrasted. The funny thing about the art as it came out was that it was the antithesis of all of that. It was like the anti-psychedelic but yet somehow part of it was embraced by the psychedelic community and some of it was really reviled. So I'm kind of curious to know what you guys thought about it in that historical context. I mean, uh, just speaking of the jumping off point, I mean, we, we thought it was a scream that Margaret and Walter were based in the hippest place in the West Coast. I mean, you, you had Greenwich Village on the East Coast and you had North Beach on the West Coast. You, it couldn't get hipper, and they are so square. <laughs> but they, ch they chose it to be based there. And, and so they, they were in it, but they really weren't of it. I mean, so, so Mar you know, Walter was working the nightclubs. M Margaret was back in her home, and she really had no interest in hanging out with, with, the, with the beatniks. Uh, but we, we, we definitely we, we brought uh, in, in Christian Ritter's character to sort of get the audience up to speed with that was where the world was at with, with what was hip and what was modern. What was funny was when we did our initial research, we went up to San Francisco to try to talk to people from the art world. The people who were like hipsters in the art world at that time didn't have any recollections of the Keens. They knew who they were, of course, but when the people who did know them were bartenders, old bartenders. I go, oh, Walter was great. He'd come in here, buy drinks for everybody, old nightclub owners. So that's really, that, that was their world as opposed to, you know, the hipster Kerouac North Beach. It was very druggy. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> big eyes, dial large pupils. I mean, it's, you know, it somehow weirdly fit into that scene. In and also the way. MDHs get really trippy, which is the Margaret's personal style, where like you really, they, yeah, you can really read psychological things into them, where there's a woman coming out of a frame or a woman cut in half, and they get really trippy at that point. Yeah. But, but I, I appreciate a lot that you think that all of us cannot remember the era. <laughs> Uh, this question is for uh, Scott, Larry, and Tim, and Amy, if you'd like to jump in on this. Uh, I was noticing something about the facts and fiction on this. Um, I recall 
because I, I remember those era because I, I lived in San Francisco during that time, you know, a little bit after that time. But I remember uh, that she was a Jehovah Witness prior to leaving uh, Tennessee. And uh, uh, was it your idea to not invoke this kind of thought into the film that, you know, because uh, it is a little deceiving if you're a devout Jehovah Witness that you're taking money from public Sandy, someone else's name on this con, you know, it was basically it was a con in a way. No, I, I, mean, I think you're actually, uh, you're, you're, you got your facts wrong a little bit. She, was, she became a Jehovah's Witness during the time period of the film, and we actually embraced that a great deal. And uh, her becoming a, a Jehovah's Witness was, uh, was something that we found fascinating, and uh, we wanted to treat it with respect because it actually was a gigantic thing in Margaret's life. So uh, at, at least from what she's told us, she became a Jehovah's Witness after she went to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, she was... She, she was Methodist. Yeah, and she, and, but she was always... And what we, we sprinkled throughout the film is that she was dabbling in a couple other religions here and there, numerology and stuff like that. She, I think her isolation made her feel like she was, had to look for a higher answer. And uh, um, you know, initially when we were thinking about doing the project, we never thought about putting the religion in the film. But when we talked with her and met with her and found out how important it was to her, uh, we just embraced it because we, we loved the fact that you know, when people are watching this movie and those two women start walking up that, that driveway, they're like, where is this movie going now? You know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's actually really important to her life today. So I, we're, I think the movie is very positive to Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, and, and, and before Margaret got to that point, I mean, when we interviewed her, she, she talked about her days in San Francisco and, and she, were, she referred to, like, you know, she would poke around in, in the Buddhist temple and she would talk to palm readers and she was interested in astrology and so she was always kind of looking for the answer that worked for her. And, and then she found it with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I think that was back to what Amy was ma mentioning before about her taking ownership yeah. in regards to being a little deceitful. So that's the reason why I was asking about the, whether or not you wanted to put more emphasis on that or was it just your decision to just to let it go with the storyline? You know? Well, I don't think she was, uh, I, I guess I don't know the timeline exactly, but I, I don't believe she was, uh, a Jehovah's Witness and lying at the same time. I think that was, it all kind of happened at the same time that she told the truth and became a Jehovah's Witness. It was part of why she wanted to tell the truth, and I think it's why she still takes responsibility. I don't think she's interested in putting blame on anybody uh, exclusively. I mean, of course she thinks Walter was crazy, but, but she takes uh, responsibility for being a part of it. This movie is um, based on Margaret's life story, and it's great that you had her involved. But I was wondering if Walter were alive today, this is a question for Amy and Christoph and the filmmakers, would you have wanted to meet with him? And if so, what would you ask him? And if, Amy, did you get a chance to meet with Margaret's daughter at all? Yeah, Margaret and Jane are really close still, and she's very much involved in her life. They're yeah. always together. So I got to speak with Jane. But I wouldn't want to meet with Walter. Heck no. I wouldn't want him. We'd have to keep it yep, secret that we were making the movie. You should read his autobiography and then ask yourself that question. <laughs> <laughs> or try <laughs> to read it anyway. <laughs> he was a great lover, a great man of many things. Well, in his version, <laughs> he was uh, Henry Higgins, and she was Eliza Doolittle, and it was a failed experiment. <laughs> wow. yeah. The mood of the film is a very interesting mix. On the one hand, I felt like I was in an Arthur Freed production. Uh, uh, there was some uh, American in Paris, especially in the paintings. On the other hand, it seemed like um, a rewriting of Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, where the um, queen is the one who can spin straw into gold and he just sells it very well. Um, uh, I'm thinking about other fictional references that might have been there aside from the life uh, story for anyone. I mean, uh, a, a big touchstone for us jumping off was uh, the sweet smell of success. If any, you remember, any of you guys remember that movie, it's a terrific movie about uh, uh, press, uh, uh, press journalists and publicists in New York nightclubs about 1960, and sort of their desperate need to get their, get their names planted in the paper every day, and it all takes place sort of against the backdrop of, of the Chico Hamilton quintet, 
in, in jazz clubs and everyone's dressed up really well and everyone's got a martini in their hand and everyone's kind of trying to claw over each other to get their name into the paper. And, and so uh, that was a, a big influence for us. But I think also what you're recognizing is that the, the movie does have a mixture of a lot of things. And I, I think that's one of the things that Scott and I embrace. I think it's one of the things Tim embraces, and that's why we work very well together, is that one minute it's a, it's a comedy, and then there's a love story, and then it becomes a, a Hitchcockian thriller. And it go, they can sometimes go through all those things in one scene. And uh, we, you know, we never understand why you have to necessarily declare a major with a, with a tone. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's why I think that it makes our collaboration with Tim very special. For Tim and Amy, I was wondering, as and, and anybody else, as parents, what kind of life lessons that you think this movie um, tells and, and how it informs, being parents, how it informs choices of movies like this for you? I, I don't know if it, that has anything to do with it for me. I mean, I, I came at it from a strangely, uh, on one level, a because growing up in that era, you know, where, where these children and and understanding the culture that I grew up in, the sort of the end of the American dream sort of idea, and the idea of these sort of dysfunctional couple coming together and creating these mutant children, just felt like my family. You know, I mean, it just felt kind of like that sort of. So, it had a strange. Uh, so I kind of came at it at a strange way. So, you know. I'll never show this film to my children. <laughs> I'll show them Sleepy Hollow or Sweeney Todd, but not this one. My, uh, actually, it, it actually played a great deal into my interest in the film. Uh, I think I read it before I was a mom, and I saw Margaret one way, and then after I had my daughter and had been a mom for about four years, I saw it a completely another, a total different way. I, I sort of understood this flawed parent, you know, because uh, I definitely feel like one. Uh, being an artist and being a mom sometimes keeps you at odds. And not to say you can't do it, but um, an artist's life can feel very uh, isolating and very narcissistic. And being a parent needs to be something completely different. And so um, I understood that sort of thing and trying to make the right decisions and then getting caught in a lie with your child. That was something that I found really fascinating. And I was really... a really interested by that dynamic. I'm sorry, I'm catching, catching lint, sorry. Uh, I'm so comfortable in front of a crowd. It's, <laughs> another thing I identified with Margaret was just like, oh gosh, I have to talk in front of people. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it played a great deal. And um, Margaret said something great the other day when, when I asked what she wanted, uh, she was asked what uh, she wanted to walk, people to walk away from the movie she said. Stand up for yourself, be true to yourself, read your Bible, and don't lie. Hmm. Which is uh, kind of great. But she went on. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, this question is for Tim. Hi. Um, so this film, like, it's not a typical Tim Burton movie, like, visually. It's, your other films were a lot darker, even, like, speaking of, like, light and color. So just tell me a little bit about your choices, like visually, to you know, make the movie look like you did. Well, I mean, we, you know, it's a combination of things. We sort of went off. For me, it's you know, you have the time, you have the era, uh, you have the paintings, uh, which suggest something. Uh, strange color schemes that those the, the, the paintings sort of part of the vibe of it. And then just the story. I mean, you know, the relationship between Margaret and, and, and Walter, the other characters, it, in my own mind, it started to feel like a weird 60, like kind of slightly Hitchcock or, I, I found myself strangely drawn. I mean, I know, you know, I always loved the films of Mario Bava, but the color schemes uh, in some of his films just fit the, the era, fit the painting, it fit the sort of psychological kind of uh, relationship and, and, and feel of the movie. So, um, you know, whether it's black and white or color, you know, you try to, 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 to support that as make it a character in, in a way. So it just, all of those elements sort of is what made it, you know, what it, what it turned out to be. If I may add, I was there every day. I can prove beyond reasonable doubt it is a Tim Burton movie. <laughs> I showed up occasionally, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
team. Um, as your film vividly shows, there is a struggle, there is a fierce fight between the abstract art and uh, realistic, or how you call it, figurative art. Uh, I'm just curious about uh, where are you in this struggle, and uh, do you have a personal stand? Well, I mean, it, that, again, it's a fascinating thing about people's perception of art, and you see it today. I mean, you know, it either speaks to you or, or, or it doesn't. I mean, I mean, the keynote, or what, I think the reason the story didn't really, wasn't so, sort of flew under the radar is that most critics, most people didn't really consider it art, so it wasn't really, you know, it was kitsch, or, you know, so it didn't, it didn't hit the major headlines, you know, it was sort of probably on the back page of the, you know, Honolulu, <laughs> you know, whatever. But uh, uh, I, like I said, I myself have experienced from the very beginning of my career, people loving or, and hating, you know, and, and, and also, Films were saying, "Oh, this movie—it's—it's it's so much lighter." And then the same movie, oh, people say it's so much darker. So I found that that sort of juxtaposition of like, how can something be really light and something then other people see it as completely dark? And so people's perceptions of things are fascinate me. You know, I mean, and I think I think this is a perfect story, an example of uh, of that sort of question. It's kind of an unanswerable question. It's just sort of a uh, you know a presentation of, of that dynamic. I will also say that, the, that you know, Tim was the only director that we actually offered this to, and, and I think one of the reasons uh, was that he is a visual artist. He is a, he, he is a, a person used to uh, expressing himself via either films or, or the canvas or the sketches, and so we felt that he could really um, put himself in Margaret's position, where a person who, who you know, isn't necessarily great at giving speeches or, or selling himself or this the sense that like you know uh, the work will speak for himself and, and the Tim is definitely a believer in that. I was wondering um, it seems like Margaret has kind of an up and down with kind of feminist values she starts off by leaving her husband and clearly feeling that she deserves more um, going on these interviews and then of course with Walter things dip down and then by the end she seems to be embracing um, being able to be equal, and Deanne also seems to uh, kind of feel that way, have sort of uh, feel that they should be equal, that she knows something's wrong. So do you think either of them really, whether throughout the movie or at the end, identified in with feminist values? I wouldn't know about Margaret. Just, she wasn't a part of like movements. Do you know what I mean? She just was sort of as she puts it, well, I was in a closet making paintings. Like, she, so um, I like the way that uh, Larry and Scott brought that into the movie because I do think, whether intentional or not, she did do something that had that was very much of the moment in standing up for herself. And I do like that. That's that um, sort of coincided with such a great push in the feminist movement. But I'm not sure that Margaret was aware that she was doing it uh, for that purpose to be a voice for all women. She was really. Uh, probably doing it to be a voice for Jehovah and for truth. Uh, Larry and Scott, I wanted to know, was there anything in doing your research that you found out about them that you could not uh, put in the film that you might want to share? We can't tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were certainly lots of crazy events that occurred in their lives, but the, the, the key to doing a, a, a movie biography is you're taking someone's life and turning it into two hours, so just you has, have to leave a lot of things out. Uh, the actual, you know, the Life magazine piece that's referred to in the film was actually a crazy section at one point because uh, they, were, they were sort of separating at the time, but, but Walter had convinced Margaret to come back and, and actually they, they had they were sort of like faked it for Life Magazine that they were still living together. Um, and so that kind of stuff was really crazy, but it just didn't have any place uh, in the film. Hi, um, I guess this is a question for Scott and Larry, maybe Tim. The film definitely makes a case as Walter being kind of the originator of bringing art to the masses. Do you think his kind of craziness and downfall negated that in the end, or do people still see the Keens as that kind of representation? I, I don't know if Walter's been given the, the, the credit he's, he's due for, for cheapening art and <laughs> uh, spreading it in every direction. Uh, 
but you can, you, you can totally draw a line from Walter to Warhol to Peter Max to Thomas Kincaid, and it took a certain genius to say, why do we have to sell originals when we can just make uh, cheap posters and staple them into frames and sell them in pharmacies for 25 cents? Yeah. I mean, it hadn't occurred to anybody before. He did it. And it's funny, going to Art Basel, I, you know, we always made that connection to, say, Thomas Kincaid, but being there, you, I could see the connection to Jeff Koons and Schnabel as well, you know, or just like the, uh, you know, the, that, that sort of exit to the gift shop mentality that the modern art world has that really began with Walter Keane. Uh, I asked the actors what it was like being directed by this Mr. Burton fellow, and uh, if there was anything he said that was particularly helpful in performing your roles. The room so they can speak freely. Put on headsets, maybe. I'll leave. Get off that easy. Go ahead. <laughs> See? I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. That says it all. As long as, as, long as he's sitting. Uh, it's been terribly, terribly exciting. I'm obviously a big fan, and it was just, uh, it was a great, uh, great to visit uh, his world. Yeah, it was a, a total dream come true, and he was lovely, and I think he, um, he made fun of my feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. No. <laughs> it's not that easy, you know. <laughs> um, no, it, it, in all seriousness, you know, the, the, the thing about the Tim Burton movie, this is not so much a Tim Burton movie. Um, um, it's, it's almost... Uh, uh, a redundant thought because it's um, whatever he does you invite it to participate and that invitation um, sort of puts me personally on my toes and that's where I want to be I agree with everything Christoph said <laughs> I'm going to steal it and present it as my own um, <laughs> No, but uh, I agree. It is very inclusive, and you are invited to participate. And I'd been wanting to work with Tim, like, forever, since I could think about being an actress. And so, like Margaret, I'm not a really great self-promotion expert. Like, <laughs> mostly I just stutter when I meet people I want to work with. So, um, luckily, that worked with Tim. <laughs> He's like, I, I totally well. get it. Um, but I did, I wrote him a letter when I heard about this and that it was coming back around. I sent him an email expressing my wishes to be involved. Um, and it, it was awesome. I was one of the most relaxed. I, I, I was so relaxed on set, which I, I don't feel I should have been, but I, was, I just felt like I was a part of a big group, a, something bigger than just what I was playing, and, and that was a really great feeling. Yeah, for me, I loved it just, well, I loved working on it, but working with Tim, I felt, uh, I don't know if you guys feel, but there's a in enthusiasm and ex you, like uh, excitement and fascinated by what we were doing and an enjoyment uh, and s laughing and s smiling, like enjoying what we were doing. At, uh, every take, there was uh, in like um, joy, I felt. Um, that, was, that, was, that was really fun to do, you know, like th that we were... Um, we were taking great pleasure in it, it felt like. So it was wonderful. I thought he was just laughing at me. Yeah. Thank <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody for coming out here. And... Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey.